Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 1 million high quality video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 25% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code FRAMERATE1213. Cord cutting means using on demand services like Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Instant to circumvent the cable companies. You can watch what you want, when you want. Fascinating. There are a variety of devices out there. It's Frame Rate! Welcome to Frame Rate episode 151. I am Tom Merritt. That, my friends, is Brian Brushwood. No, wait, he's over there. there. I'm over here. I'm, there, I'm, right. I'm focused. Hey, listen, I, that's a hell of a get. How did you get George Takei to exactly say our tagline for Frame Rate? Welcome to Frame Rate, the show that thinks you're going to be able to watch the stuff you want, when you want, on whatever device you want, and we're going to bring it to you. Yeah, it's become a meme. I, d I would love to think that it's us that are permeating that into the consciousness but I kind of think it's just out there now. I mean, probably George Takei got it from Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey probably, I don't know, he picked it up from maybe Dana Brunetti, who's been on yeah, this Yeah, okay, no, hold on, hold on. Don't sh don't short trip yourself here, because there was a discussion where did, we did, said, did, hey. Did, 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 did you hear what I just said? I Go think ahead. we made a connection. Oh, because Dana Brunetti. You think that Dana Brunetti <laughs> heard us say it and passed it on. Sorry, yeah. now I'm getting it. I was already all fired up, like saying, hey, man. Don't deny us this credit. We deserve it. And by the way, chuckling like a hyena in the background is our esteemed guest this fantastic episode, Mr. Just Robert Young, author of Go Home Santa, You're Drunk, available at GoHomeSanta.com, available both as an album and an ebook. How you doing, Justin? Ah, oh, Brian, I am I'm absolutely fantastic. I'm ready to, to rate all these frames. None will be spared. We have so many freaking frames to get to, Justin. You're going to be like a pig in frames. <laughs> Start with the big story. This just in, the big story. So now that Amazon is uh, shoving the show alphas in your face on every page of Amazon, I don't know if you guys noticed this lately when you go to Amazon.com. The Black Friday ads kind of minimize it a little bit, but they're basically like, hey, want to see John Goodman in a show? Click here. Uh, a lot of people are writing up stories about this. Brian Bishop has one on The Verge over at GigaOM. There's one by Liz Shannon Miller. And what everybody's wondering is, okay, why isn't Amazon... And Hulu, who've been doing originals now for a while, uh, getting the same kind of love as Netflix. Brian? I had a massive Skype hiccup, so I have no idea what you just said. But I do think it's a good time to say, um, what? <laughs> All right. Here's the deal. Uh, and I don't have hard numbers on, uh, on Hulu. But the answer, number one, is to get praise, people need to see what you have done. Right now there are, according to estimations, 10 million Amazon Prime subscribers. And those are people that are, by and large, I think many of us are, even though we enjoy original Hulu pro or sorry, original Amazon programming, we're there for other stuff, like to get things free or like free, quote unquote, two-day shipping. And not necessarily there as an on-demand uh, service. Netflix has 40 million at last count uh, estimated subscribers. They are only there to watch stuff. So if that is the measurement of it, there's just way more people watching or inclined to watch Netflix stuff, which is the necessary prerequisite for people to like it, let alone for it to garner awards uh, consideration. First of all, what so, is it called? Is it called Amazon Instant Prime Video or Amazon Prime Instant Video? And how is that different from Amazon? Is it Prime, Amazon Prime Instant Streaming Video? What's different? Than, and then you look at Hulu and it's like, well, there's Hulu, but then there's Hulu Plus and they both have ads and Netflix is simple, right? That, yeah. that, well, that could be part of it, Justin. 
that is, again, in the tree of brands, you want to carve out a niche where you are exactly one thing and you have a knee-jerk reaction. When you hear that name, you know it means exactly one thing. When you say Netflix, it means on demand on my computer or any device, and it means uh, uh, originals that blow your mind with talent that you've heard of before. Uh, Hulu Plus, and I think you did a really good job of, of couching this, Tom. Uh, Hulu Plus kind of means one thing or the other. It's very difficult. It's, it's slightly mushy, but at least Hulu Plus still means that's television on your computer. At least it's still in that wheelhouse. Amazon Prime needs to make a decision because I, uh, people are signing up for a shipping service and, by the way, getting an original content distribution channel. And I, I, I don't see how this is tenable in the long term. I don't see what it is they're going for. Well, you realize that, um, uh, that John Goodman goes on The Daily Show and John Stewart says, uh, hey, how do we see it? And John Goodman says, I don't know. And then John's like, John Stewart's like, no, seriously, how do we see it? He's like, uh, I don't know. I think you have to get a box for it or something, which is, of course, not true. Like Amazon Prime, if it wants to, if it wants to succeed in whatever it is it's trying to be, it needs to clearly define in one simple phrase what it is. Well, I, I, but also, for, for, for your point, Brian, Netflix was many things. Netflix was getting a, a envelope in your box. It was honor. It was just licensed programming before it was original programming. They've done a very, very good job of phasing in one or the other. And each time that they come with a new proposition for the consumer, they make it as attractive as possible. I think Hulu, or uh, yeah, Hulu is probably closer to where Netflix is because I agree with both of you guys. This is a shipping service right now that we're dealing with, and they, uh, Amazon might come to a point where really they just need to spin this hub of original entertainment or licensed entertainment that they have into something else, which right now it's kind of hard for them to do because if you go into their amp to their video library, they want to also sell you things. They also kind of want to be iTunes as well as Netflix, which is very, very odd considering iTunes is very successful at selling uh, piecemeal content. Netflix is very, very good at selling you a subscription access to content. But the problem for Hulu is, I don't think that quality-wise, they're really in the same level as Netflix or Amazon. They're not spending the same kind of money. They're not bringing in the same kind of talent. And from what I've seen of all three, they are easily a distant third in terms of quality in the finished product. When you look at the later seasons of Misfits that they commissioned, you look at the booth at the end, which they also picked up and commissioned an extra season of, those are quality and, they're, and there's good people in them. They just don't have the profile because they're not, they're not HBO quality. Right, they're, they're maybe AMC quality, probably USA Network quality. And Hulu has to compete with itself. When you put that stuff up there, even if it isn't quite Netflix quality, but is really good, is who's gonna watch that over the big name stuff that's coming out from the major networks? That, that, that is a problem Hulu has with its originals. It has to sink some money into making something that's just as good as what's on primetime, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox if it's going to have its original stand out in its own lineup. And I, I wonder how much the Amazon website thing does matter because if you have a Roku box or even if you have an Xbox One, uh, you get the Amazon app, you sign in with your Amazon ID and you're, you're there, right? Like how many people are actually watching this stuff on the web in the future, right? But they, That's where but they still looking. want to sell you stuff. I mean, even in the dedicated apps, you look for, you know, I want to see Mel Brooks movies. I go to Mel Brooks and it shows me things and I click. I'm like, oh, great, I can see that. Oh, no, that's a dollar, even though I pay for Amazon Prime. They mix in those results, which I think is just not a great user experience. Uh, yeah, okay. And, and, and what's funny is I've always regarded that as a benefit to it. And we've talked about this previously on Frame Rate, but to me, uh, you know, Amazon is a store. So when I go to watch The Shield, I go to Amazon and I search The Shield and I look and the price says, oh, zero, you're a pal. Go ahead. Just go ahead and take it. Like the, to me, the, I get a little thrill out of that every single time I do it. Uh, but it sounds like to you, you get the reverse. Like you want it to be a Netflix experience. You're like, what is this price tag? What is this crap? I mean, if, if you look at the two most successful versions of this, it's either I paid you money and now I am able to get things that I have paid for or it's come into this market where you can buy anything off the shelf. And uh, I don't, I mean, I think that there's a lot of things that are kind of wrong with, with the Amazon experience. It's just, to me, it's always been a little bit, just the few degrees kludgier than Netflix or iTunes. But uh, that, yeah, I think that is, that is a frustrating thing because, you know, if you're not looking to spend money 
on something and you find what you think you're looking for in the context in which I've already paid for this and then it asks you for more money, yeah, that's frustrating to me as a consumer. Although, just just to take a step back and give us a little bit of perspective, right? Because Alpha House is is a decent show. I've I've, I've seen a couple episodes now and I actually really like it for what it is. We are sitting here battering about how of the three major online streaming television services that are making original content just for us on the internet, why is one of them better than the other? Can you imagine two, uh, telling two years ago even ourselves that we'd be having this conversation? Well, and, and, and no joke, I remember saying right here on this program that Amazon Prime was like the RC Cola of, of your video options. And to see them up in their game and in so many ways overtaking Hulu, that I never would have predicted that two weeks ago, two months ago. Two uh, years ago. <laughs> two, two decades ago. Time back. Two centuries ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, I, I will say this also. There just is a difference between drama and comedy. And, and I, Amazon obviously came in a little stronger with, even though Alpha House is not necessarily a, a sitcom or anything, uh, it is kind of more of a comedic bent from Gary Trudeau, sure. somebody who is known for political comedy. Uh, there is a reason why I think Netflix went with dramas. They went with the surest bet you possibly could with comedy in terms of Arrested Development, and that got mixed reviews despite the fact that it was, you know, a fairly flawed product. So uh, it, it is, it, comedy's hard, and I think it's harder than drama to do, especially- Dying, if, dying is easy. Yeah. Ask, ask Crackle. All right, <laughs> let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Oh, hey, I did, I did want to uh, give a shout out to Brian Bishop at The Verge, who has a really good article about Amazon's process. It's, it's stuff we've talked about on Frame Rate before, about how they've done innovations in the piloting area and how they're taking scripts and all that. So go give that a read. It, it'll be a link in the show notes or just look on The Verge for it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this Variety ad, uh, article. Comcast and Nielsen planning to deliver ads to video on demand that are the same as the ads that you would see on the day something broadcast. This is a little hard for some people, I think, to wrap their head about, but let me let me try to give you the idea. Right now, video on demand is not monetized the same way as an original broadcast. So we have all of these weird things of like, well, let's rate the DVR within three days because then that ad message is still fresh, but the advertisers might have changed their message within three days. So if somebody watches a commercial seven days later on their DVR, that's not as good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Video on demand usually has a totally different set of ads. It's the same problem that online has. So what Comcast and Nielsen are cooking up is the idea that, hey, let's monetize the catch-up service the same way we monetize an original broadcast. So if you go and watch episode one of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., for instance, on demand, you would get the same, you would get ads delivered fresh in that experience Nielsen would rate that in that experience, and then you could charge the advertiser for the eyeball instead of trying to say, well, but the, those are those are old views, et cetera. It's not the same. It, it, it's basically trying to say, let's charge you for the person watching it, and who cares what they're watching, essentially. Well, and it sounds to me like this is a case where uh, it, you mentioned that it's not just a case of, of getting the right eyeballs. You want the right eyeballs in the right promised demographic. I want people who tend to be the age and sex and social income or whatever of the people who are watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And I want them in roughly this time window, and I want this many of them now. By doing this, it allows them to match and get a more effective uh, 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 conduit between what the advertisers want and will pay for versus, I mean, because again, it doesn't matter if you're watching this week's episodes or two weeks' episodes uh, ago. The fact is, is today... December 2nd, as we record this, you're watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and that means you very likely fit these demographics that this product wants to reach. And I think this is, I, you know, it, these aren't sexy stories, but I think they're important stories to get us to the world well, that we want here on Frame Rate. Well, I, I think uh, at the same point, that Adirondack chair would look really good on the starboard side of the Titanic because there's really no point in us looking at this and, and anything other than these are the cable companies and the networks trying to uh, readjust the, the picture. I mean, they should have been doing this forever. 
when when DVR was the biggest way to catch up on stuff pre Netflix beefing up their instant streaming in, in 2008 with the Stars Act with the Stars deal that really kind of launched that platform. Uh, they should have had these ads on there. And it's only been in recent years when you've seen any kind of ads. Most of them are house ads, basically, for the network that are plugging other shows that are either debuting at the same time or upcoming in the future months. Uh, it's, it's, to me, this will have very little to do with, with where, where people who are listening to this show uh, want to go in terms of new media. It's just a way that the networks can kind of show, oh, yeah, by the way, people are still watching our stuff. Maybe we should put ads there. I don't know. Well, I think it's more important than that. I, I think what is sexy about this is the idea that these fake delineations, the reason that I don't have any Fox shows on demand on DirecTV is the fact that Fox doesn't see the point. They don't see the money they can make. Now, if DirecTV were to sign up with the Nielsen program like this and say, hey, somebody watches a Fox show, your Fox ads that you sell can go right in there and you can make money, Fox starts to change their mind. So it's not, let's, I, I look at it and say, forget the delivery mechanism, right? Because that's going to change. This is all going to be done over the internet. And whether these companies survive or not is a totally separate question. The fact that we see these companies coming to terms with the idea of, oh, you know what we need to do? We need to let people watch whatever they want and make money off that instead of trying to force them to watch things that we want them to watch because that's what we know how to sell. And so this is this is a big move for these companies to be able to do this because if Nielsen does this for Comcast and they do and they're also doing some online ratings for Hulu, uh, you're you're starting to blur these lines. It's no longer a difference between like, oh, that eyeball was watching on a cable provider and that guy was watching online. It starts to be like, hey, my ad's getting rated no matter where. And as long as I'm reaching the person I want to reach, that's all I care about. And that yep. why that's good for you is that the providers of the video won't hold it back anymore because you're not being counted. You want to be counted everywhere for ad-supported stuff anyway. Well, yes. I yes. Agree. No, I mean, I, I agree. I just think it's... It's very late to the game on this. And, and yes, it is a significant move that it is happening. Yes, it is better than if it didn't happen at all. But I don't know what the, the gigantic seismic change will be in this now compared to if they had done it, let's say, closer to when this seemed to be more of an obvious move for you know, the future of big content creation. Well, and, and I guess uh, here's the thing is, is no, you're right. We started talking about this when it was a first wave thing. It's, it's, this is a lagging indicator, but the fact that it's moving means this is now where the back of the tide is and, and, and everything else, all the action is happening ahead of this. We're never going to go back to a world where they couldn't update these ads. So, so again, yes, it's a lagging indicator. Yes, we were talking about it two years ago, but there's a two-year transition to get to this point where finally they're caught up here. You know, hopefully in the next six months, they'll get caught up to the kind of things we were talking about last year. And then, you know, a year after that, what we're talking about now. As long as that, that window of time just keeps getting smaller and smaller. Uh, you know, this isn't time for feedback, but Milo uh, wrote in and said, hey, I was uh, just dropping by. Uh, you guys saved me a couple hundred bucks with one of your sponsors, Shutterstock, saying thanks, and I'm glad I can support the show. Well, thank you, Milo. By the way, Frame Rate Today brought to you by Shutterstock.com. Do you want to be a rich man like Milo in Mexico? <laughs> You might want to check out Shutterstock. Shutterstock has the perfect image or video for your next creative project. Whether it's for your website, a publication, an advertisement, a video, any other type of project, you can choose. Get this, Brian, from over 1 million high-quality stock video clips, 2D or 3D animation and motion graphics. Look, man, I ain't no scientist, but last time I checked, uh, I believe it was the great Albert Einstein that said, a million? Damn, that's a lot. He said, uh, e actually, no, Brian. MC saved. That was incorrect. Uh, I believe it was Albert Einstein that said, a million. Damn, that's a lot. Okay, well, <laughs> the Hebrew is German, so it would be pronounced yeah. that way. You're right. Yeah. Uh, Shutterstock sources video clips from around the world, as you know, they review each video individually, but that does not slow them down. That's how they got to a million. They're adding 12,000 video clips each week. Every time you visit, you're going to find something new. They have these sophisticated search tools. So if you say, I want to find a, an illustration of Albert Einstein waving his finger at me, <laughs> you will find that. 
I'm looking at it right now. Well, no, that's amazing because it'll it'll overlay over something else. And he's like pointing down at it. He's saying, look at me. I'm Albert Einstein. I know about stuff. Look at what's below. Dude, you can uh, find video assets. Chat room, the, yeah. Hang out real quick in the chat room. Beatmaster says, I see more and more mentions of Shutterstock in the end credits of big movie productions. And that's that's that no too. joke, man. Yeah. Shutterstock, like like the, the, the grown-ups use Shutterstock because they are curated. Oh, yeah. They have professionals looking and say, is this good enough that professionals are going to want to use it? This ain't no open marketplace. Anyone can open up a hobo tent and, you know, sell a piece of cardboard and try to tell you it's art. They want good stuff that belongs in high quality productions. You know, I'll, I'll bet you that that, that new uh, Kanye West video that everybody was making fun of and James Franco and uh, Seth Rogen did the parody of, I will guarantee you that one or both of those videos, at the beginning there's these big opening vistas of horses running and mountains and everything. One or both of those videos got their images from Shutterstock because they look in that amazing uh, picturesque kind of way that, that a lot of these uh, big natural images look. And also, it, they'd be stupid if they didn't. Because what? Well, hold hold on, Justin. You're starting to scare people. They're they're starting to think I have to be a big movie producer. I have no. to be Kanye. To, no, no. You can try Shutterstock today by signing up for a free account. You won't even have to pull a penny out of your pocket or your credit card number either. Just start an account, begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your next project could be like and save your video selections you find to a clip box. You don't have to pay anything for that. So that picture of you climbing the stairs, that picture of old people, that scary statue that you don't want to blink when you see, save all that to a <laughs> clip box. Once you decide to purchase, use offer code FRAMERATE1213 and new accounts will receive 25% off any package. That's Shutterstock.com. For 25% off new accounts, use offer code FRAMERATE1213. We thank Shutterstock for helping to defray the expense of doing <laughs> FRAMERATE. Shutterstock.com, big supporter of FRAMERATE. So you should, you know, give them at least give them a shot. FRAMERATE1213. Let's slip into the stream. Yeah, the slipstream. Slipstream. Hey, Xbox Video is launching on the web. So this is kind of like a voodoo ultraviolet thing where you buy it, buy it on your Xbox One. You can watch it on the web, but you can't watch it in HD yet. And you can't watch it on your phone yet if you have a Windows phone. But hey, Xbox Video on the web. How, uh, how many passes do we give to a new console or service? Um, I, I mean, this is, it, this is brand new. Well, so. okay, yes, but, but it, it, it doesn't one. matter. Look. It's possible to launch a thing that's new and have it be complete upon launch. That is a thing that can happen and has happened before in the past. Um, it just more and more of the Xbox One experience, everything I'm hearing about, because um, uh, despite rumors to the contrary, I, I did not buy a Xbox One the day it came out. So what? I actually don't know. What about yeah, for no. you and all your friends? No, that's that's what I thought. It, it didn't happen. But, uh, but, but a lot of the Xbox One experience really does sound like it's like, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. It's out now. Uh, go ahead and get started. Which well, and the I, other thing I is, this is brand new, Brian, right? Um, and it's confusing because I'm like, hey, I bought stuff on the Xbox 360. I bought some episodes of MacGyver and Star Trek. You know, I can't wait to find them at video.xbox. No, no, this is entirely new. Uh, you have to have bought them on Windows 8.1 app or the Xbox One. Then they'll show up at video.xbox.com. And they do say that the HD is going to come down the line. Uh, so as long as it doesn't take forever, I'm, I'm willing to give them a little bit on this. Also soon to come, talkies. <laughs> They're eventually going to bring talkies to your Xbox. Uh, no, see, Brian, it. here's the issue. They want your money now. They'll finish it later, right? That's the key issue. They just want to sell you the thing. Uh, the product, they'll figure it out. You know. Well, now wait a minute. You guys are making such a big. How many? How many times do you watch video from Netflix or Amazon or Hulu on the web? Always, all the time. In fact, my kids, my Fine. kids prefer it <laughs> over. Like, like I, I have to kick my kids out of my office because, uh, like it's just enough a pain in the butt for them to turn on the Xbox and go load in, and they know if they go to dad's and office. And now Microsoft just has Netflix. made that possible. If you have an Xbox One, <laughs> all just right, not an HD. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I honestly do look at this as sort of a perk. Like when I buy, if I were to rent or buy a video from Xbox One, 
I would not expect to be able to watch it on the web. So now that they've added that, it's like, oh, well, may, maybe I will. But yeah, they've got to add a few more things. And I mean, I'll tell you what, it is one thing, and not everything doesn't have to stack up to every everything else, but the one thing that I have really enjoyed uh, as, as Apple has kind of flattened their access to the things that you've bought is realizing that everything I bought on iTunes, be it music, television, or movies, I can now have on all of my internet-connected devices, and that's... That, that is a, a, like Brian, you said, the, the experience that you have, if you go into the Amazon store and you see that zero price tag, like it's always like, yeah. oh, look, Zombieland. I remember I bought that. Yeah. I'll watch yeah, it now. Yeah. Right. It's, it, Microsoft's slowly moving down that road to become one of those, but they're not yet. If I'm on my Xbox One, I'm going to watch Amazon or Netflix before I'm going to, to actually buy or rent something from Xbox One. And if anything I might rent, I'm probably never going to buy at least not until it becomes a lot more robust. Do you guys notice that all the all the Xbox commercials are with, like British narrators? Has anybody else noticed that? I have not. They're all. It's that. like, what's the sway with the British on on the Xbox? I don't get it. If you want HDMI pass through that almost never works with our providers, it will work with yours. In I the know. United States. It's always like soccer and like you know pointing at them. You soccer fan, we're Maybe playing they made now. International. Or they're creepily like turning into messy. I don't know. It's a. All right, let's put on our. Tube I want you tops. to know that I had an awesome Skype hiccup, and I have no idea what you said, but I just heard people turning into Nessie, which I assume it was highly intellectual. Whatever you guys <laughs> just talked about. I was talking about tube tops. Hey, good news for TiVo finally, not. 13 years later, TiVo is making money, and they're making money off the cable companies. Uh, they actually had an increase of 295,000 subscribers in the third quarter thanks to cable and satellite television providing subscribers to the DVR service through its set-top boxes. Uh, I think it's like a 32% increase year over year, and they're making money. They uh, forecast uh, $83 million of revenue uh, for the next quarter and a net profit of two to five million dollars. Now, this is interesting. At a time when we're starting to wonder if the cable operators are stay are on shaky ground, right? The subscribers for reg traditional MSOs have been declining. The subscribership for, for satellite has been increasing, but not at the rate that it used to. TiVo's finally like, hey, we're here and we're winning, sort of. Well, and keep in mind, when I first read this headline, I I thought it was an abject lie because the headline <laughs> is TiVo beats estimates as cable subscriptions rise. And I thought, you know, for two years, we've been reporting about the decline of cable subscriptions. But then I realized that these aren't cable people subscribing to cable. These are right. people who have cable subscribing to TiVo. Um, and it makes sense. Like in a world where everything is terrifying and it's all going to crap, all of a sudden your old nemesis TiVo that was doing that filthy time shifting that was such a problem for you and your advertisers all of a sudden, they seem like an okay ally. Maybe you can get behind actually encouraging people to, to, to do it. Well, the, the, the larger point is that uh, protected monopolies have a lot of money. And uh, to get access to their customers who are already used to paying for a bunch of stuff that they really have no idea what the hell it is, TiVo at least represents a value-added proposition. Whereas there's more channels, there are more channels available for you now than ever. That is something that continues to expand. You have no idea how to get to them. Dealing with the cable provided solution for finding programming and recording it is still a pain in the butt. TiVo has always offered you a better solution to that. So it is, I think it's a great marriage. But my, my question is kind of the same way that we're talking about getting the ads onto uh, the, the on-demand viewership, the current ads. Is this a move a bit too late? For TiVo, are they experiencing a good surge now? But like Brian mentioned, is the general trend of cable viewership and subscriptions in general going to make this a rather short party? I know. That's I, a I, good get the, I, I get the feeling that TiVo has been racing to catch up. And the, and the guys up ahead were like, no, no, TiVo, you can't run with us. You can't run with us. And TiVo was like, no, I'm going to run with you. I'm going to run with you. And then it finally, the, he it caught up and he looks around. And all the guys have let him catch him because they're like starting to f to have heart failure and they're, they're <laughs> falling over, you know. And Tivo's like, "What? Like, 
I'm here, you guys. Let's let's party. And they're like, we don't feel so well. Uh, sorry, Tivo. We can't we can't play with you anymore. Let's let's move on to something happier. Film film. <laughs> We touched on this a little bit last week, but the numbers came out after we did uh, frame rate. Uh, the live simulcast pre and post show event of Doctor Who's uh, 50th anniversary special, Day of the Doctor, was a record breaker in television ratings around the world. 2.4 million viewers on BBC America, which increased to 3.6 million following an encore screening that was added in the next day. Uh, and, and of course, they had the, the 3D theaters around the world. Uh, which ended up at least per theater beating Catching Fire, Hunger Games Catching Fire. And it was, you know, the first ever worldwide simulcast. It was the, it was the first ever simulcast on television and YouTube from the from the YouTube studio over in, in LA where my wife works. So this is this was a big, big day, not just for Doctor Who fans, but but sort of for like, hey, Let's just get rid of this stupid distinction where you have to wait for something to show. We'll just put it out there for the entire world at once. They didn't quite go as far as streaming it online while they had it on broadcast, but they did part. They kind of put their toes in the water there. Let's this, do it this again will... next year. <laughs> the 51st <laughs> exactly. anniversary. Well, and think about this. The whole, the whole metric about uh, beating theaters that had Catching Fire, I mean, uh, as long as I've seen Doctor Who and been a fan of Doctor Who and seen other people who are fans of Doctor Who, everybody wants the legitimacy of every of, of, of Doctor Who getting the respect it deserves. And in many ways, they did the perfect thing because to show it in a movie theater gives it that big screen experience with zero compromises. You don't have to talk about how the movie wasn't as good as the TV show in that moment because it was the TV show and it was a celebration of everything. As you said, it was very much fan service. Uh, I think they did a great job. I think I think hopefully there are lessons to be learned about how this is what it means to be a citizen of the Internet, where it's like nobody cares what time it is in Europe versus the West Coast of America or whatever. I want to watch it. I want to watch it live. I want to watch it as the electricity is happening in the moment. Uh, I, all of that was was fantastic. And I and I love seeing Veronica get name checked in the Giga Ohm article on there. That, yeah, was, that pretty was pretty cool. Nice. Just as friends of Ms. Belmont. Indeed. Uh, she hosted the uh, pre and post show on BBC America and did a, quite a good job. I think she did great. She was she did a very good job. Uh, <laughs> see, now this is where I think the TiVo and the ads on the on-demand thing, this is, this is a good example of a current problem being rectified by the, the proprietor, by the big media company, and getting it right. The problem is, let's sync all this it's a massive problem to sync not only the technical issue of having it all go on at the same time but also to sync up all your rights holders and the bbc has very fortunately unlike some of their other programs like uh luther and sherlock which won't experience a situation like this owns the rights worldwide to doctor who and a lot more of their own bbc owned subsidies so this makes it a bit of an easier problem for them to fix but the fact that they made it a priority and they made sure it happened, and they kind of even did a bit of a test run with the whole announcement of the new Doctor uh, as a, a similarly simulcast event. Just shows a great dedication, and, and it is something that I agree with with Brian, that, you know, to be able to unite kind of globally with this community and everybody celebrate it once and be able to talk to uh, every, you know, person who's using the same Day of the Doctor hashtag about what you thought about the little moments as they happen is hugely powerful. And it was a great and fitting celebration for such an amazing fan show. Yeah, Doctor Who and BBC making good use of Tumblr, uh, it, this article points out, where they're they're not just writing a Tumblr because they're the BBC and like, okay, we have to promote Doctor Who. They're taking fan Tumblr posts and resharing and reposting them and creating trends and, and actually participating in the community, which I also think uh, they deserve a little credit for there. Hey, uh, what time is it, Brian? It's time for feedback, bro. No, it's scan lines. <laughs> you know, we got a lot of people wrote in with love for the uh, song of the summer based scan lines thing, Brian. But we're holding uh, firm, right? It's too long. It's too long. We needed a too shorter. Long. It's going to be this for the for the for the moment. All right. 
Uh, would you like to kick us off or shall I? No, I'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, listen, you got your, your uh, you got your summer, your, wow. your winter movie draft. Boom, sorry You've got the that. fact that Comcast, season is great, I got more time. Uh, Comcast, of course, made news with us right here on it's Frame Rate a while either. ago when they started offering a cheap way to get HBO. It looked on the surface like maybe you were getting HBO uh, and only a la carte, but of course that wasn't the case. There was fine print. Now Time Warner to compete with Comcast is offering something similar. Here's the part that confuses me, Tom. Uh, since when do cable companies need to worry about competing? It seems like whatever neighborhood you live in, that's what you get and shut the hell up. Yeah, that's really interesting, huh? I mean, I don't know what kind of pressure Time Warner Cable feels except maybe national news where they hear Comcast being bandied around. They're like, by golly, we want people to buy Time Warner Cable stock. Let's get out there and undercut them. Uh, well, and it's, keep in mind, like, what they're really what, what they can, I, I suspect that what they're doing is they're pretending to compete with Comcast. They're really competing with cutting the cord. Intel, uh, we've talked about this a bunch. They on queue is for sale, but the latest uh, stories from early last week were that they want $500 million. So pretty much they're like, sure, Verizon, you want to buy it? We don't care. $500 million. Justin, you want to scrape together $500 million and buy the on queue set top box service from Intel? No. <laughs> Now, now the thing Can is, we is save that, the is rest that, of the time for another topic? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, no, hold on, though, because th there's enough enthusiasm about this. Like, keep in mind, nobody's seen it. No, we haven't seen it. We don't know what it looks like, but it's obviously pretty enough that m media insiders were, were talking all about it. Uh, I, I, I suspect that the interface is really pretty badass. Why? Why do, well, Why because do we suspect it? Be because my guess is that because of all it was those another, great Intel interfaces. Uh, well, because right. they hired a bunch of smart people would be what I would say that were not necessarily employed at Intel. Tom, what do you use yes. your 3DS for? Your Nintendo 3DS, your little 3D handheld game system, used to if play I games. If I had one, Brian, I would use it for watching YouTube. Well, <laughs> you, you wish. There's no way that you can use one of those to... Wait a minute, there is now. Because YouTube finally arrives on the Nintendo 3DS, and I know what you're <laughs> thinking. Brian, for two years, I've been hearing about YouTube having 3D streaming capability. Surely, a device whose entire marketing message is based around 3D will take advantage of this. Finally, we have a handheld lenticular 3D experience that you can enjoy 3D at home. And I say, stop talking, Tom, because 3D support is not supported. That, you know what? That doesn't that doesn't surprise me. And the reason is, I'm assuming that YouTube's 3D is is some kind of polarized glass supported one, not lenticular. And YouTube isn't going to go and recode everything just for the Nintendo 3DS when it took this long to get them to actually add your stupid app in the first place. So yeah, it's weird. You know what? But no, it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> right on. Hey, Amazon Instant Video is launching in Japan. So maybe this is going to help uh, boost them. Maybe they'll figure out how to make a little, little bit more accessible. They've got 26,000 movies and TV shows, roughly 15,000 of those available in HD. Rentals start at 100 yen. That's about 98 cents for 24 hours. So that's pretty cheap. Uh, good. This is, I, again, man, you might as well tell me that they... Uh, that that Winterfell finally has uh, Amazon Instant. I mean, it's like, I, I, I okay, it's, it's all... Fictional foreign lands to me, and I'm glad you think that, that the finally, Japanese are the watchers on the wall who keep the White Walkers at bay. Is that yes? They all they're 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 constantly on guard against Godzilla attacks, and uh, we thank them for their constant vigilance. And so our honorable watch begins. It's going to be huge for that that Alpha House premiere because it's got the cameo from Bill Murray, who was gigantic in those yes. Santori time commercials. For a relaxing time, make it Santori. Time. That's a good point. Intensity. Uh, right, I'm intensity. gonna rely on I'm gonna rely on Justin for this one. The headline says Xbox One owners report compatibility problems with UK TV providers. Did you read this, Justin? Can you explain it to me? Because I'm dumb. <laughs> uh, sure, Brian, I did. Uh no, I didn't. So I'm gonna wait till it okay, loads. Ta Tom, can you explain it to me? <laughs> yes, I can, uh, Brian. HDMI pass-through requires 
on the Xbox One, the signal to be at 60 hertz, because that's what we use here in the United States. And Microsoft is American, Brian. 50 hertz, PAL signals, your European. We don't support that craziness. We're imperial measurements, no metric system here. Well, it doesn't have to do with that. But yes, that, that's what's going on is they've got PAL at 50 hertz in Europe and the Xbox One says, nope, I can't do that. There is a workaround when you go and you go into settings and manually set this up. You can say, no, my TV picture doesn't look good, even though it does. And it will force the 50 hertz out. Are all their advertisements with American narrators? That's what I want to know. If I, if they were all British narrators in theirs, then you get it and it's screwed up on your TV. What the hell's the point? You're British people. You're telling me, stop Xbox. Put on football. HBO shows are now available to purchase from the Google Play Store in the UK. And they they don't have to have British accents, although Game of Thrones would be one of them. Uh, but, 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 now, hold on. Uh, like, is Game of Thrones available on yes. anything? Yeah, because the first... First three seasons are, are well, that's live. True on, that's true in the U.S. On, yeah. on iTunes and Google Play here. You can't get the current season when it's on, but you can always get the past seasons eventually. That's what they've got going. Right. So well, for all yeah, you guys I mean, who've said before, oh, we'll take the Wire Challenge, but only after it's available on the Google Play Store. Well, guess what, jerks? It's time for you to start buying episodes of The Wire. Well, in yeah, a month. I guess it's not, that one's not up there yet, but in a month. It will be eventually up there. By the time you get around to watching this episode, because you're so backlogged on podcasts and it's the last week of December and you're on holiday break and you're like, oh, finally get to that frame rate from early December, you'll be able to watch this. It'll be perfect for you. All right, let's move on to the winter movie draft. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Tom, I don't know about you, but if it were me, I wish I could be Justin Robert Young. He who grabbed Catching Fire and is making all the monies. I'd say Justin Robert Young's movie draft chances are Catching Fire <laughs> right now. $395 million, he leads Casey McKinnon, $370 million. Now, here's the thing. Catching Fire won the box office two weeks in a row. So they're at $296 million. He's already in front of gravity. It looks like they're going to keep going. What happens next is Justin has Out of the Furnace, which comes out December 6th. Uh, Casey has Saving Mr. Banks, which is the Mary Poppins story, which comes out on December 13th. And then Casey has one more movie on Justin, which is The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, coming out on Christmas Day, December 25th. So Hunger Games and Out of the Furnace have to outdistance whatever those two make because gravity's finally slowed down, slowed down enough where it's really not adding anything to her pile. I don't think old boy is going to be adding much either. I'll tell you what, it all boils down to whether or not Secret Life of Walter Mitty is a hit or a miss. And I think it's going to be a miss. Like the marketing oh. I'm seeing for it is not firing anyone up. No. I what mean, about that's, Saving Mr. Banks? No, you don't. Saving that... Mr. Banks might have something to me. I'm more worried about Tom Father Hanks. Robert. Uh, uh, Frozen had a huge opening weekend. Yeah, that's true. Frozen's got legs. Uh, if that continues to roll, holiday then, movie. Yeah, then then that might be a big thing. But other than that, if if the Hunger Games stays on the trajectory that it's at right now, and then I get literally anything but a hot fart out of out of the furnace, then this one is a wrap. But it actually uh, looks like it what? might might be a race, which we weren't thinking earlier when Gravity overperformed. We weren't thinking it would be, but Hunger Games has overperformed, even though we expected it to do really well. Yeah. So uh, on a side note, first of all, let me let me explain that I have no illusions about coming in anywhere except for last place. But I'm fascinated to see how big and loud the Anchorman hype engine has been uh, to the tune of flying out Will Ferrell to North Dakota to full on newscast for a half hour on the local news station. I, I didn't watch the whole thing, but it looks like he just played it straight the entire way through. He was just Ron Burgundy hosting, yeah. anchoring the news there. No, it was it was it was pretty funny. I think the the video is up on. Uh, I saw it on Deadspin, but I'm sure it's all over the planet. Uh, they have have totally cranked it up, and it, it's funny. You look at uh, very similar to Doctor Who. They noticed that there was a gigantic propensity of Anchorman, the original movie, gifts. So they've been doing nothing. There's like a person whose job it is to watch the new Anchorman movie and just create new GIFs. And they're just putting oh. them out on the internet, like on their Tumblr or whatever. There's just like three GIFs a day from the, from, from the new movie. Apparently, you would be able to piece them together and watch the entire film silently <laughs> in GIF form. Let me tell you, I've been seeing a lot of previews for Tyler Perry, a Medea Christmas. 
on the television. <laughs> I mean, here's the larger question, and especially with Star Wars moving from summer to winter, is in the draft, especially with Star Wars, are we? and this is summer and winter, are we going to have to face reality that there are some movies, because we'll have to split Star Wars, because otherwise Star Wars will ruin the draft. It'll be everybody. No, no, I, everybody I, I, will I, wait to spend a hundred. No, uh, I'm, I'm going to say no. I, I I don't see that being a problem. That's like, if you like only had million. Star Wars, do you think you would automatically win the winter movie draft yes. that year? It's going to do I like eight hundred million dollars. It's I going to be you. the it's no. it's got a legit shot to be the highest grossing movie of all time. Even I, so, even I don't so. believe you. I, 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 you know what? Other movies I hope will make you money. go into the bidding. I hope you go into the bidding believing that, Justin, because you could be our own Tom Merritt and open the bidding at a hundred dollars. I got it. <laughs> I mean, yes, I'll be happy to do that with Star Wars Somebody Episode Seven. I, I want to see what happens actually if we do that. I, I, think I mean, because be I basically invalidated the movie draft with the Hunger Games. Yeah, but that was also true of Twilight. It was true of Harry Potter. But you don't know that ahead of time. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, it. I thought I was going to, we thought and plus also, other things like, were we, going to invalidate the summer draft and they didn't. So Tom overpaid for The Hobbit last year. It's like, yeah. it, it, to be honest, like your attitude of, well, it's all over because obviously blank is what undoes dynasties. It's it's the epic flaw in everyone. Now, in this case, it's working out great for no. you and you probably will win this draft. But but to say that we need to change the policy of the game because you, Justin Robert Young, are so certain that Star Wars will make all the money, I don't think it's a good well, idea. No, I think listen, Tom uh, I, I step take, aside and let you spend a hundred dollars for it. I take I take this from the other uh, 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 as the parallel development of movie drafts. Uh, the Simpsons writers' room and us, uh, they they eventually face the problem, according to the one article, about splitting movies into shares uh, because they found it but, to be but, but, but a better game. Again, have, I don't agree with it. And I don't agree with it for the summer. I don't agree with it because there's more money in the summer. But mm. they, they, but they have more players though. They that's part of the reason they did that. But like, I don't we know. We always lock it. I'll tell you what. If you guys are gonna let if you guys are gonna let me walk into Star Wars Episode Seven at a hundred bucks, then I'll be happy to just end the draft. Yeah, good. Let's, let's we'll see what happens. Actually, that that would be interesting. We are. Uh, you guys know I'm talking about Star Wars, right? The think, Star yeah, Wars, a new Star players, Wars but, movie. We just only the have Star two players. Yes. We're very aware that you're talking about that film franchise that hasn't had a good movie in 30 years. Yes, that's the one we're talking about. The one that has been literally a middle-aged lifetime All since right, they now we're gonna, anything like, that like, anybody It's going about. to make... Let's, let's, let's not start debating whether Star Wars is going to be any good or not. It's going to make a lot of money because it's got J.J. Abrams' name on it. It doesn't matter. I, it, let's save this for another day and move on to what we're watching. <laughs> Watching. Les Brian, you were trying to delay because you have you had not been watching anything? Uh well no no no. I I uh I actually have watched stuff with the kids. Oh, uh we got caught up on Legend of Korra, almost caught up. Well, like we got two episodes left. The entire season available on, on Nick.com. Uh man, so good. Uh even when I thought I wasn't gonna be into it, it sucked me back in. One of the later episodes did the whole if you if you watch the previous ep uh, episodes they tell the story of the first avatar and uh it's 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 great man it's really really good that's all i gotta say about that uh did you get my note about walking dead i tried to text message you about it yeah i saw i saw that this morning but i've been on planes all day so yeah, i haven't had a chance to see so it I, I heard, yeah I, I heard it's safe to to get back into the zombie filled waters which i'm we excited did have about. one guy email me and say hey man Leave Brian alone. I think we've got that in the in the email, so we can talk a little bit about that. But I just just because we won't be having a spoiler zone on it today, I did like the ending. It, it wasn't perfect, but it definitely ended things, and it ended things in a way that satisfied me. That's all I'll say. I am also watching The Shield. Epi I watched episode three, so we could do a little spoiler zone on that. If yeah, you. no, we, let's let's keep talking about that because I'm curious about what's happening in your brain as you go through it. Now, uh, Justin Robert Young, is this? Do I read this right? You've been watching Thirty Rock. Thirty Rock. It's a brand new hit show from young <laughs> upstart comedian Tina Fey and the the guy from Beetlejuice, Alec Baldwin. Uh, no, I, I I missed the last two seasons, so I've been uh, watching it on Netflix. And man, 
that it doesn't often I think get put in to the reverence in terms of amazing comedic writing that Arrested Development does but I, I'm kind of of the mindset that it is a more impressively comedically written and acted show than Arrested Development and this is coming from somebody who would consider himself to be as maxed out an Arrested Development fan as possible so if you have not given it a shot for whatever reason or you haven't caught up on it I think it's all on Netflix the entire series and I am delighted with it I watched I the uh, Adventures in Space and Time again over the weekend too which is the that it's a movie. It's not a documentary about the early days of Doctor Who and the founding. It was just as good the second time. Uh, really, really well done. I haven't, seen, I haven't seen that yet. Is that is that where is that on that I can yeah, see? Yeah, uh, I I have it on my DVR. So I'll give you my Slingbox password. No, I, I think you can buy it on <laughs> iTunes too. Good. And by the way, that that's like a legit use of Slingbox, right? The entire uh, you know ethical versus legal thing with Slingbox is it is a virtual conduit to your actual. DVR device, so it is yeah. exactly the same as handing Justin a key to your house to watch that. I off don't of know if it violates Slingbox terms of service at all. Yeah, it might, um, but yeah, I'm going to no, say it's, it's ethical if not legal. Sure, <laughs> I was watching it at in San Jose at my father-in-law's house over my own Slingbox, and you know, right so on. yeah, I could be at Justin's house. I could sure. be. Yeah, why not? You could. Right. I mean, you could drive right up from San Jose and go and physically go to my house in Oakland and totally. watch it. Yeah. Let's get to some feedback, shall we? Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. William Hines uh, says my question relates to the things we can watch anywhere, anytime. Digital media has become the content manner with which to consume media, but has come with a few consequences. Recently, we've seen Disney pull content from Apple and Amazon, and with the new game consoles, set-top boxes coming out, streaming is becoming more mainstream than ever. The movies and games you bought can either disappear when a new device comes out, a contract expires, or content is just taken away because of money issues. What future do you see in media consumption when the things we buy aren't really ours? Are we destined to lease a license for content in the future as physical media is replaced for convenience? Uh, here's the thing. And uh, from a legal framework, yes, I, I hate that in order to make this stuff available, the content owners have to have the assurance that nobody's out there watching movies when they don't know about it. And of course, that's the appeal of streaming to the content owners. However, for the consumers, the world is only going to get more connected. We will never be less connected than we are right now. It's only going to get easier, and there's going to be uh, broadband available in your minivans as you drive around in a quick, easy, reliable way. And once that happens, it's like, who cares? What's the difference? Uh, what's the difference? I mean, if you believe in the cloud, believe in streaming that way. Now, on the other side, I do agree that there is a lot of worrisome aspects to licensing agreements that can be yanked away. However, as people begin to associate the idea of I paid $20 for this Blu-ray, I have the ability to stream it anywhere on any device I want, you've taken that away, somebody will make the mistake of making a change and it will backlash in a huge and terrifying way to them and they will, uh, they will regret it. So in that regard, I think that's gonna be a self-correcting thing. Yeah, in fact, the Disney thing that he mentions there in his email was corrected. Disney said, oh, wait, that was a mistake. iTunes went in and, and re-added the, uh, the, the rights to people. So I think there is, a, there is the chance, a very good chance, that while companies can take your rights away, they actually won't want to risk it because of the public backlash. Uh, I think it's also a chance. I mean, there was a story out today saying that since digital rights management was removed from music, sales have gone up of digital music, that eventually we see video places saying, you know what, having to put DRM on these things is just an unnecessary expense uh, and let's just get rid of it. In which case, when you store something locally, you've got it and they can't take it away from you. So although, I think although both, I would both say of those things are possible. Music sales going up might not necessarily be the best barometer for DRM because music sales in general is probably something that when continues were, to rise digitally. What the, study, what the study did particularly was say, what were the sales of albums before DRM 
uh, was removed. And what were the sales after? So they were comparing apples to apples, like same songs. Yeah. And they even did controls for popularity and changes of, of taste and rise and fall on charts and all of that. It was a really well done study to try to tease out all those things you're talking about, Justin, and say, what was the effect of removing DRM if you tease everything else out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's the right thing to do. And, and, and really, I think the fall of DRM is more on the side that uh, the people who are putting it on see very little benefit from it. And it's always going to be expensive to try to maintain and track and stuff like that. And if they can cut costs, especially in a turbulent market, then there's something they're going to do because it's dumb. All right. Jason says, hi, guys. After 15 years with the Dish Network, I finally cut the cord. After watching your show, I learned that Aereo was available in Denver. Signed up immediately to test it out. It took me a good week to muster up the courage to call Dish and let them go. When I called, I got the, we have new packages coming soon, spiel. I just said, no, thanks. I don't need Dish anymore. After hanging up with Dish, I felt good but scared, like I was giving up a drug or alcohol. I'm sure that put that on your posters, uh, Dish. <laughs> After three days dish free, I felt my recovery is going well with the both of you as my support group. I think I'll do just fine without Dish. On a side note, Aereo feels like Netflix in the early days of streaming. Lots of buffering, but I have confidence they'll work it out. Thanks for all you guys do. Jason, congratulations, Jason. Good job. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. That sort of fear of like, can I do without it? I might need it. And, uh, and, and just, you know, we've got a whole Google Plus group of people doing the uh, the chicken yeah, challenge. So. Group. Good. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, just go to Google Plus, type in chicken challenge and uh, introduce yourself. We'll all repeat your name. We'll talk about our stories of how we hit bottom and finally realized that we had to cut the cord. Hi, Jason. <laughs> By the uh, way, Tom, Tom, yeah. Tom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tease something, right? Oh, yeah. What if like next week or the week after I told you I was going to get back on cable, like I was going to relapse, I was going to go back to cable? Would I would, you, you I, would I would call Justin. Uh, we'd yeah. both get a flight out to Austin, and uh, we'd be at your door as soon as possible to sit down with you and be there for you. Brian, there is literally no reason at all whatsoever, full stop, why you should backslide. I can't think of one reason <laughs> in my entire imagination why that's something that you would want to do. Well, I don't know. Maybe next week I'll, uh, I don't know. I just have this itch that I feel like. I'm feeling like maybe I don't should do just it, get Brian. Don't do it, Brian. Don't do it, man. No, Stay Brian. strong. Stay strong. Because there is literally not one single compelling reason, a Look, huge, massive, Brian, gigantic reason why Brian, you should get cable again. A, a it doesn't land. exist. Okay? There's nothing good there that you can't see otherwise. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I just feel like maybe maybe there'll be some program that I just really want to see. I'm just Nothing's possibly, worth it, what Brian. What could possibly be there? I don't care it. how charming and delightful the programming are on these cable channels. <laughs> Even a fresh new face that would captivate a nation with his smile and wit. Fie on right. you who thinks that that's worth getting cable again. You could probably get that same kind of face, charm, and wit on the internet without paying. Yes. All right. I guess I guess I'll take your word for it. We'll check right. in next week on it. We'll check, we'll check in. Somebody would be very mad if you didn't tell everybody to watch it on cable. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, our our next email comes from Earthquake Bamba, who's mad at me because he says I never do a good job of explaining why some shows are available on Hulu but not Hulu Plus. Earthquake Bamba feels that it always ends up sounding like Hulu is a bunch of idiots. They can't even cross reference their offerings to make sure they're paying customers get everything the customers get. The truth is, Earthquake Bamba says, they have some contracts that explicitly specify that you cannot stream on TV or mobile devices. I think they would stop the Apple AirPlay if they could, but it falls into the category of people with computers hooked up to TVs. There is no easy way to stop it other than strong arming Apple into preventing it. So either they include only content that is able to stream to TVs on both Hulu Plus and Hulu, or they show everything they can on both platforms, even if it means some content is not available on Plus. Earthquake Bamba, I apologize if I have not made clear that that is the reason that Hulu Plus has has less content sometimes than regular Hulu. But that does not change my opinion at all that I think it's idiotic for me to pay more money to get less stuff. That I totally understand that that's the position that Hulu has been put in. But I still, I don't see why I would possibly want to pay for something when it gives me fewer things. 
That's a good point. And and I'll tell you what, and actually this is this is one of the things about frame rate is there are times we talk about the hypothetical uh, and what consumers want or, or whatever, but then there are the very real circumstances where maybe you go against your plan to never go back to cable <laughs> because you personally have something that you really want to maybe, see. Yeah, so it's maybe, like, yeah, maybe some sort of weird confluence of arrangements happens. Exactly. That's true. And, That's yeah. true. Uh, we got we, and our final email there, Brian, explains the whole HBO Nordic failure. Uh, yeah, it says uh, this is from a genuine Swede named Daniel. Love the <laughs> show. Let me fill you in on the situation regarding HBO Nordic that you brought up on Frame Rate 150. Nothing personal, but you've probably been never wrong, more wrong in your lives. <laughs> HBO is huge in Sweden and it has okay, been good. since the early double zeros. Since Sex and the City and The Sopranos, new shows brought from HBO. A bot from HBO by networks over here always advertised with their origin clearly stated, and it's a big selling point. Your idea that American shows don't sell in Scandinavia, which I don't think either of us said. Did either of us say that? Ah, uh, who knows? Maybe we implied it accidentally, but I wouldn't want is to have said it. Uh, is completely inaccurate. I, I, I think what I was saying was that um, HBO doesn't exist as a... Uh, as an institution, a cable institution in Scandinavia, the way it already does in the United States. In fact, locally produced shows have trouble competing against shows acquired from the U.S. Look, you're talking to a guy who lived in Norway, and the highlight of my week every Thursday night was when they would show a rerun of the Cosby show with subtitles in Norwegian. What did cause problems for HBO Nordic was a disastrous launch in the wake of a massively successful launch of Netflix. The sales pitch uh, was that while you signed up for Netflix on a monthly basis... Uh, for 79 kroner a month, about $12 US, HBO Nordic would require subscriptions for several months, up to a year, same monthly price, but all paid in advance. This was just too much for the audience that preferred to keep Netflix rather than paying for both or switch. HBO Nordic has since altered their subscription plans to match Netflix's, but the public remained skeptic because of the initial mistakes. Thought you should know to keep up the good work. Uh, Daniel, thank you for giving us a boots on the ground report. Yeah, no, that all makes a lot more sense now. It was just a, it was a pricing and marketing failure. And it's good to know that HBO doesn't have any other uh, weirdness in Sweden as far as like, oh, people just aren't familiar with it or don't like the shows or anything. No, it's it's none of those things, at least according to Daniel. So thanks for that. Appreciate that a lot. Also, thanks to you, Justin Robert Young, for just being you. Oh, come on, guys. Stop it. GoHomeSanta.com yes. is the URL for your new book. And it's an audio book too, right? Yeah, uh, it has an e-book and an audio book. The audio book is, is almost kind of more of an album. It has a full jazz score by Andrew Allen. You can get it at GoHomeSanta.com. Uh, $2.99 for the e-book alone, $5.99 for the audio book alone, or all together for $7.99. Uh, but here's the deal. Tomorrow... We're doing a real big push. It's going to, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it in the morning stream, the, the Scott Johnson Frog Pants Show uh, tomorrow morning, as well as on NSFW, uh, uh, right here on the Twit Network uh, at 10 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow night. Big push for the Amazon version of the book. So if you are listening to this on Tuesday, then go ahead on over to Amazon, search for Go Home Santa, you're drunk, uh, and buy it. Uh, we're going to see how how high we can get up the holiday charts for Amazon. See if we can't get ourselves the number one holiday book on Amazon. Let me tell you what. I, 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 I was expecting to like it. It was not what I expected, and it was better than I expected. So do yourself a favor. Go home. Santa. Yeah. I guess, yeah, so it's nine, nine short stories. They're all different short stories. Some of them are funny. Some of them are not funny. All of them uh, have great uh, score. Under it, uh, if you like some of the stuff that we've done on NSFW show, uh, there's a, uh, a Alex Jones esque uh, conspiratorial rant about uh, Santa Claus on there. There's uh, some more horror sci fi genre stuff. There's uh, really sad, depressing stuff. There's slapstick comedy. <laughs> but go ahead and check it out. GoHomeSanta.com. Uh, I'm very, very uh, overwhelmed by the reaction so far. Uh, I've loved the fact that people seem to dig it. And uh, I'd love to hear what you think. Go ahead and go get it and let me know. Hey, Brian, do you have anything going on that you want to plug? No, nothing no. at all. Just no. on no a vacation in beautiful That's... Hollywood, California. Can't a guy take an unscheduled vacation to Hollywood without everyone getting on his junk? I'm, I'm just hey, having man. a really good time. I, I was just asking if, if you're, you're enjoying beautiful just, downtown just, Hollywood. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm enjoying the beautiful Hampton Inn and Suites. I highly recommend it. Close to the Burbank Airport.
Ooh, we're at the Bob Hope Airport. Uh, oh, right. I, I guess I should say that uh, uh, if you're listening live, you got six more hours on the scam stuff sale for oh, do that know, yeah for Cyber Monday. There's that. Cyber it up. Hey, you can find us ASL. on the web twit.tv slash fr. <laughs> Our YouTube channel is youtube.com slash twitframerate, which, by the way, if you're watching live, stick around for this week in YouTube. If you're not watching live, pretend like you're watching live and download and watch this week in YouTube right after frame rate. It's the perfect dessert to our frame rate meal with Chad Johnson and Lamar Wilson. New media you can us, block. <laughs> you can email us at framerate at twit.tv and, of course, watch us live every Monday, 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern. We will see you next week. Silent Green is people! Well, I know this will be a shorter spoiler zone, right? Because you've only watched one more episode, but, but three episodes in, I'm hopeful that you feel scooped into the characters a little bit more. Because what's funny is listening to you talk about the first two episodes, you refer to that guy who's a detective and this guy who has the curly hair and whatever. Like, at some, at some point, I'm hoping you'll start referring to them by their character names. Because to me, they're real people. Right, right. Uh, it's no, I still, still think real to me, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I still think of it as Mrs. Frederick from Warehouse 13. Doing their interrogation, but it's Vic, right? Yeah, yeah Vic Mackey is the main character. Yes, Vic, of, I, of I've got, I'm, on, I'm on to Vic now. Uh, and yes. episode three is a really interesting Vic character study. You get a lot more depth to his character suddenly uh, because they've got the whole. It's it's a funny episode because they're keeping the the New Jersey Nets. They're still in New Jersey at the time of the shooting. They're keeping the Nets star, trying to keep him away from the basketball game. Uh, and there's some disturbing stuff in there too. But but and then you've got uh, them doing the interrogation with the sex offender, trying to track down the prostitute. So you, you, you're you moving away from the story arc a little, but you're learning a lot more about these characters. And they were quicker with the edits. They did some they did some good stuff where they're like, you know, he's just going to say no. And then they go to the captain and he's like, no. And then they cut away. Yeah. Like they don't, they don't spend too long. So they're starting to feel like they have their own style now, which, you know, the first couple episodes just felt like a typical procedural. So yes, episode three, enjoyed it. I uh, feel like I am getting to know these characters better and, and see their motivations. And I'm starting to see threads of more interesting parts of the plot than just the typical, you know, he's a good cop gone bad or he was always a bad cop, but he's doing it for justice. You know, and all those things that you, you would normally expect from a show like that. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see because uh, those first few episodes really do try to have you put all the characters in their respective file folders. Like, he belongs here. He's this guy. He's that kind of guy. And then as you get more depth with all of them, I think they become more interesting as well as less in their individual category. Man, it is, it is heart-wrenching watching a friend watch a show you really like, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, it really is. Like, it, it, like, is, it is just like you feel like you are... A, opened up just a little bit. It's a small part, but an intense element of your soul that you that is unspooling without you knowing it in somebody else's living room. And they are judging you based on how much you've liked this <laughs> well, show. That right there is how fanboyism happens. Right there. Yeah. That's exactly what you're talking about. That's why you become a fanboy and get all upset when somebody doesn't like your thing. Well, and, and no, for me, I have, like, I have my own chart of, like, Oh, are you watching Lost? Uh, second season, disregard the first six episodes, they're boring. Third season, disregard the first six episodes, they're boring. Friday Night Lights, the whole second season. Just forget it ever happened. Just just get through it as fast as you can. Don't worry, it gets better in the third season. The Wire, uh, yeah, just uh, I understand that the first six episodes, they really just drop you into the story. It's okay if you're confused. I, I have like a guide in my head of all the shows that I really, really love and I'll recommend uh, wholeheartedly to friends and the trouble elements where if they're like, uh, I don't know, it's like, what episode are you on? I'll talk you through this. Don't worry. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Yeah, and I feel this. like the entire audience the feel the entire audience feels this way towards Brian right now because he's like, eh, I don't know if I want to watch The Walking Dead anymore. And there's like a big chunk anyway, not the entire See, audience. Brian, like, this is why you need to have Brian me on the show more. Yet, please, he needs to watch it. They're like so invested in that idea. Uh, uh because uh, I'm with Justin. Brian. We both we both dropped out of The Walking Dead around. I'm 
I'm back on it. I'm back on it. And oh, are you enjoying it? I, I, I am. I will watch any episode that doesn't have the governor. And so there's one more episode <laughs> I have to get caught up on. Uh, no, I've, well, the I've heard, I've heard the, good things. So wait, so you're saying it, it's worth it to get back in? The season is worth no. it to get back in. There are the yeah. two of the last three episodes focus on the governor, which I, knowing Brian, and some guy took me to task on this. I'm like, no, this is a Brian specific recommendation. I'm like, he is not going to like anything after the first 20 minutes of that first governor episode. And he might not even like that first 20 minutes all that much. And so I'm like, just, yeah. just don't even bother watching those episodes. Go to the midseason finale. The governor's in it, but really all you have to know is that the governor has new motivation, and it'll be very obvious what that motivation is. And then the rest of it's just an epic battle, you know, that you wanted to see happen in the other season, but you finally get it now. Right on. Rad. Was it Gregor1942 who took me to task? He's claiming responsibility in the chat room. So is the PLO, though, so I don't know who to believe. Uh, I don't know. I, I got to get back in. But right now, The Walking Dead is behind. Oh, I, I, I anybody is anybody caught up on Justified? Yeah. Never watched it. Man, I uh, we've talked about this on the show separately, but, like, Justified, I wanted to believe was like The Shield and uh, jumped in, watched the first, like, four or five episodes, and it just felt much like Tom is experiencing with The Shield. He he just sees the – it, it's just a, a police procedural – and it's hard to, for him to get in. Like, that's what happened with Justified. But I'm told, like, second season, it really starts having well, no, an Justified, arcing story. Justified is a really unique thing because it was a show where the first half of the first season, they're like, oh, this is badass cop in, the, in Kentucky solving crimes each week. And then about halfway through, they're like, no, this is, like, meth, you know, white trash redneck version of The Wire. And... <laughs> That's what they became. It was like a pulpy Elmore Leonard uh, version of the you know, organized crime in the South, uh, with with Raylan Givens being your your kind of a little bit more of the Gary Cooper sort of cowboy protagonist. But past that, man, every season's been so good. And I watched the entire most recent season on the planes back and forth from uh, Asia, uh, and it was amazing. Just so good. So so. It's like. There's just nothing else on television that's giving you that kind of uh, pulp, uh, you know, just awesome storytelling that's, like, really immersive and also just has all those, like, cowboy, hard-drinking, fast women, you know, kind of uh, fun stuff. This right may on. be the least spoilery spoiler zone we've ever done. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah. Which is totally fine. I still it was it. a good one. Uh, well... That is it, my friends. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.